Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Erica Mello and Susan Clinton, and welcome to episode number 118 um, and of Tough to Treat. We're cl clocking along, Susan. <laughs> That's right. We're moving towards that 120 mark. We're, exactly. Uh, this is, uh, before I, I do the brief intro on this patient, we've talked about before, and I'll give you guys the podcast numbers. We, uh, I know we've been talking about our membership, but we've got some really great news on, we're doing, um, the, the, the URL is tough to treat.supercast.com. Those are all the details, but we have an, what we call an ask us anything where our members can either post questions in our portal or come on live, which is what we're doing now. We're having once a month for the next few months, a live call, live Zoom call, where our members can come on and just ask us literally anything, right, Susan? And mm -hmm. I think that's a huge, a huge uh, benefit to the membership uh, because sessions with us alone would cost far more than what the membership is even, you know, for many years. So- Yes, uh, absolutely. So- yeah. So, so put your questions together and join the membership. And when you're in the membership, you'll see the link to register for the Ask Us Anything. The next one, um, we haven't set the date for April yet. We are just now in April. So we will be getting that out to everybody, um, you know, so that you can join us live. Usually what we're looking for is probably close to the last Thursday of the month. Yeah. Um, to do the Ask Us Anything. So you can kind of tentatively mark that in your calendar and we will see you then. Absolutely. All and right. So on to this uh, real quick intro for this patient. We've talked about him before uh, and uh, he is, I will tell you, and, and we can just cut to the chase, but uh, he is probably all time top 10, one of my toughest patients doing well, but we're at, I'm at a point where I want to go back and forth with, with Susan on how to tease out certain aspects of his movement patterning. And uh, I, hope you, I hope you all enjoy it. Hey everybody, this is Erica Mello and Susan Clinton and welcome to episode number 118 of Tough to Treat. And I will get right to it. Um, this let's is, go. Let's do it. <laughs> In the intro, I was like the top 10 tough patients, you know, I, I have to say he didn't make the book, my book, but I hadn't seen him for many years and we've done a podcast on him before. So just for the listeners who I know, you know, I'm the kind of person who when I listen to podcasts, you know, I'll listen here and there, or I'll listen to all. So we did number 109 and 110. We talked about his early uh, early progress. And it was five symptomatic regions with one main driver, 109 and 110. That was a two-parter. Okay. So he is doing well, but I just want to give, uh, as I mentioned in the intro, I'll give you a brief, a brief sort of background on him. And then I'm going to skip to where I am now because he's been, he's been coming in and out uh, doing well, but I want to tease out some clinical reasoning and some movement pattern with Susan. So here we go. So I'll give you just a brief review of his intro. Um, 40, 30 plus male, uh, a sedentary office worker here in New York, um, he, a patient years ago um, who he came, reached out to me um, last year. So his main, his symptomatic areas were uh, bilateral upper trap pain, uh, mid thoracic sort of thoracolumbar lumbar uh, pain, uh, bilateral, he went like this, you know, so it was upper trap, bilateral neck pain and right groin pain and right foot pain. So one, two, three, four, a little bit more than five um, regions of the body. So, uh, so sort of AP sternal thoracolumbar, bilateral upper trap, bilateral sort of SCM, right groin, right foot, right foot grippy. I will not go through the evaluation. We did that in the other podcast, in the other episodes. Um, his right foot is his primary driver, okay? In his initial assessment, he told me that because over the years I'd given him things to do. He goes, when I worked on my hip, my hip felt better, but it made my foot worse. When I worked on my foot, it made my foot better, but made my hip worse. And when I work on my foot, everything else seems to clear up. So mm -hmm. it was that relationship between the hip and the foot is why he was there because the neck and the, the sternal stuff cleared up when the foot was, was, was when he sort of released his anterior tibialis, uh, that type of thing. 
you know? So uh, that's the history on him and his, uh, his sort of movements, like sports, he, he is a skier. He was a snowboarder. He felt that the snowboarding was making him worse. Okay. And so he went and so he actually started skiing, uh, went back to skiing. So this is, which is where I want to talk about now, but I'm going to just finish the background. Um, he had an issue with his right knee. He told me, but that was not really on his radar. Uh, standing was the worst for him. That was like the main issue. He's had, had a hard time standing. Sitting was fine. Walking was okay. Lying on his back was fine. Your typical, typical, right? Um, so the only thing that I, when I first saw him that made him feel feel better was doing like cat camels. And I was like, okay, I just wrote that down, noted it down, mm -hmm. and then releasing his anterior tibialis. I'm going to fast forward because this is what I wanted to, to talk about briefly in his, in his sort of standing screen, because standing was his issue. So I did spend some time in standing. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any major center of mass shifts. I mean, his pelvis and his net center of mass was slightly to the right, his symptomatic side, but not, not like, not crazy, you know, not, not crazy. Um, he, his right foot was extremely grippy, very rigid uh less so on his left okay. uh his right his right hip was you know it, as we call it sort of the shirley sarman <laughs> that anterior glide you know he had this sort of it's almost like he thrust the hip forward right mm -hmm. um and he did have an old shoulder injury in his in his history so uh his his, his scapula all on the right um was sort of dumped and he had that sort of anterior sort of profile of his right shoulder as well so it was almost like if you look at him, he was thrusting his right side forward, the shoulder, the hip, and then the foot was gripping. Okay. That was back when I first saw him. Okay. I have treated him and he's a lot better. His dr primary driver was his foot or is his foot. And I ruled out. So when I first saw him, I I, I did some standing sort of, we talk about these dural tests. I did it like a straight leg raise and standing with the right foot in front, the left foot in back with the knee straight and, and a bow. And then I switched. Um, I did upper limb tension testing and standing because standing was his issue. And I, I ruled that out. I'm just, that's, I ruled that out because I want to talk about where I am now. So okay. he's gotten a lot better with the work to his foot. Whenever he either releases his bottom of his foot, his anterior tibialis, it, I've taped his foot into that distraction taping I often talk about with the medial border of the calcaneus. He does well. Hip feels good. Whenever I go in and intervene in his foot, for example, I neutralize the foot in air quotes. In standing, his hip feels better. His hip centers. He looks much better. And he moves better. So this, where I am now is um, in the prior episodes that we, we, we discussed him, both areas made each other worse. That does not the case anymore. So okay. he's more robust. He has more choices for movement. I work on the foot. The hip feels better. Mm -hmm. Okay. I occasionally do some work on the hip. If it comes in is out like as a secondary, but I, I, I it, his foot is his main issue. I mean, it is like Susan in standing when I, even if I just put literally, even if I just put my hands on his calcaneus and just pull down a little, you can see his whole system relax. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and I have checked the neural sensitivity on him I, many times because I thought he had like a dural or neural, he may, mm -hmm. but I, I, I'm not finding it. So anyway, he goes away skiing. Okay. In the past, he had an issue with going from a squat to standing where, and I don't know if you recall, whenever he would straighten his right knee out, he couldn't straighten it out. He would turn his hip to the right and he would mm -hmm. invert the right foot. That does no longer happen. Okay. That's good. And I had him on the Pilates equipment, facing away, putting his hands on the reformer on the bar and doing some hip extension, knee extension, like with like a glute kick. He couldn't do that. Now he's fine with that. He can straighten his knee. No problem. Mm -hmm. he, go, he wanted to see um, a trainer and, um, and who was, you know, started to do some dead bug abdominal work, which um, kind of flared flare him up a bit he goes skiing and he's much better than he was in the past but he's in that hip flexion isometric you know in the boot can't compensate mm -hmm. at the foot and he 
he goes a day or two and he's fine. And then after two, three days of skiing, he's, he feels like everything, the neck, the, the AP thoracolumbar, the hip. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's like your worst nightmare, right? Mm -hmm. And he, and he, cause he hadn't, he hadn't skied since I've been treating him. You know, he can mm -hmm. run, he can do all these things. And I explained to him, I said, look, you know, yes, you got a little flared up from the trainer. Okay, that happens. It happens to every, every, everybody. And you're doing a, an activity that you haven't done in, in a while. And so we need to tease that out. And he's great with that. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I'm just going to stop and you ask if you have any questions. Um, um, so his, it, do you think that his symptoms with being in the boot, do you think that he just didn't, the boot just held him and he didn't have to worry about his foot or where his foot was or relaxing his foot or doing the things that he did with you when he was running and doing the other stuff because the boot's so rigid and he wasn't I mean, able he, to do his normal compensation. So things right. kind of got, yeah, he went like, Oh, yeah. he couldn't do the foot. And so he just sort of, well, I'll move my knee, my hip, my thorax, whatever. Yeah. That's what I think happened. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think so, happened. Mm -hmm. So, and it's when he's in his hip flexion and because his hip is very in his hip is in his mind because when he did the dead bugs and he, he, he's he overactivates his hip flexors he overactivates mm -hmm. he has a poor abdominal recruitment he does i've tested it mm -hmm. and so so here so here we go so i rechecked him i actually saw him this week i rechecked him into on the reformer and i had him put his hands on the bar again just you know push back. he was fine mm -hmm. and i had him squat just a bot just a basic squat Mm -hmm. like skiing and he was okay but it's, that's not skiing it's like you know you, he, you have to be doing it for many 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 hours right mm -hmm. however um i have access to a um a wonder chair in the in the office like a, the pilates box type thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before I go into that, I got him supine on his back with his knees bent. I said, do a bent knee raise. Just do a bent knee raise. Left leg straight, right knee bent. And he's very like 90 degrees. And he, mm -hmm. he's always, always more than that. I said, straighten your right leg out, do your left a little bit more. So he has tight hips. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do well. I, I, I didn't want to help. I didn't want to, I, in, in, even passively R1 was like at 90. Okay. So I went in and did a little bit of, I just put my hand on his foot, just did a little teasing, like teasing the skin. And I didn't want to push him. So I said, just, I'm just, just bring, take my hand with you <laughs> and bring it up into hip flexion. And he did. And it was like a hundred, like 10 degrees more. So mm -hmm. clearly that foot and open chain, even with intervention, even just holding it, Susan, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and I, as I said, I was not helping him. So I ended up also saying, look, let me just quickly tape you whatever some neural input into the foot and to get my hands off and now do your knee to chest. And he was actually still okay. So, mm -hmm. right. And so the foot is still his, I believe his primary driver, even with the skiing, the snowboarding, he didn't like, cause it was in that split stance. Right. Yeah. So I had him do a split squat. Okay. And he was okay. He was a little off with it, uh, but he was okay. But he could not for the life of him do any standing hip flexion beyond 90 where he could before he left. Uh huh. So I'm going to hold on one second. And then I want your thoughts. I got him on the one to chair. I had him sit there and I put maybe one or one of the two, I don't know if people are familiar with it, but they have these springs. And so I put two easy springs on and I had him just push down. So you're seated, you're pushing down in a hip extension, and then you're slowly eccentrically coming, letting the box, letting the bar come up. So you're east, the, the bar, the, the, the bar is pushing your leg up. And so it's helping you into hip flexion, right? Mm -hmm. He felt really grippy with that. Okay. And I said, okay, think about you know, I give him like, a, I gave him like a lower abdominal cue, a pelvic floor cue, whatever you want to call it. Okay. <laughs> I said, imagine you have to pee and there's no bathroom. That's what I said to him. And he, and he said, okay. And so he did that. And then the next thing, no, he's bringing his leg up. No problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I said, let's go into standing. Let's get off the box, do it actively in standing, the same cue. No problem. Mm -hmm. Lie on your back, do the same cue. A little bit of a problem, but not as bad. Mm -hmm. So yes, does he have an abdominal weakness? Maybe. I would like your thoughts on this because he, in hip extension, he's fine. In hip flexion, skiing, there, he's just, an, his, his main impairment is an overactive system. Mm -hmm. So when I take out the overactivity, he can fire the glutes, he can fire the hamstrings. I don't need to strengthen those. So he's, he felt that when he was sitting is skiing, th this issue with the sternal, the sternal pain that he talked about way back, he felt all of that gripping. And I'm just using my hands here, like in the diaphragm, he felt all of that gripping when he was skiing, mm -hmm. when he sort of, you know, very common sense. He, when he activates the, the, the other muscles, he feels much better. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to think from a clinical reasoning standpoint, why the skiing in that position would, would have aggravated him. I mean, I know the, the, the boot, I mean, the, he's in the boot that we yeah. know, but what is the thoraco? What is the, the, the trunk have to do with it? I'm asking you. Cause I, yeah. These are, yeah cause uh, I, I'm know. like, I'm in too deep with this guy. <laughs> I need another opinion. Well, the other thing about skiing is it doesn't really allow, allow him to access any kind of rotation, whereas running did, right. um, you know, running and walking, you have to access rotation. And I think you had said that he had issues with the thoracolumbar junction. Yes. And if you think about it, the innervation from the thoracolumbar junction, T12, L1, you know, that area is also the innervation for the anterior hip, mm, you right, know, the, right. the, derm the dermatome for the anterior hip, that's it. Um, and also, interestingly enough, if you think about flexion and him being in a flexed position with the skis, you know, so he's at hip flexion, knee flexion, and he's probably forward bent. You yeah. know, there is, there's, it also, the innervation for that area also goes to the uh, <clears throat> iliolumbar ligament. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if there's too much tension there, then it may be that he's over recruiting other muscles because they have easier access in his movement system because he's been over recruiting for so long. Yeah. When we over recruit one system, we switch off the other one. So it yeah. sounds like his central core system is getting inhibited and probably the primary inhibitor for him is going to be multifidus in that position. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so, and that may be why when he overactivates or tries to, you know, when he tries to do things like, like laying on his back and flexing his hip up, you know, he's not, he's not activating, you know, that system well. And so he's overactivating, you know, other muscles to do it. And so I would, I would look at him and I would get him going on some things like, um, you know, chop, like chop exercises, you know, coming right up like to left down. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, the ones where you pull from left up to right, you know, from mm -hmm. left up to right and those types of motions and things for him and really get his feet involved, but yeah. have him, you know, you know, check with him too. Cause you know, the other thing about this is that if he's not recruiting well, his diaphragm may be feeling like it has to become an, uh, the, the postural control muscle. Yes. And so when you were saying that he felt really grippy in the sternal stuff while he was skiing, he was probably hanging on for dear life with his um, was. diaphragm muscle. And we, you know, we have pretty good evidence to show that if we've got a diaphragm that's over recruiting and over controlling for people with back pain, you know, the Kohler articles that came out in 2012, if you're right. over, you know, if you have back pain and maybe hip pain, they just looked at back pain, but we, we don't know yet, um, you know, because they haven't looked at other stuff, but it, you know, lay, and they did the studies with the person laying on their back and they, the resistance they gave them was, you know, hip flexion, but it was with the straight leg raise, but That's it was still right. hip flexion, right? That's right. Right. And so they were showing that the, for people who were symptomatic, the excursion and the, you know, uh, the, the size, you know, the muscle size and the excursion, you know, was very, very different for, and it was a muscle that was actually flattened and over recruiting. Yeah, and yeah. so the, the, the trick here is, and so that, and so the, you know, postulating out from that research article and listening to this guy, it sounds to me more like he's got an over recruiting diaphragm and that's what's inhibiting right. his deeper core muscles. He's yeah. using it to hang on. And so maybe perhaps going after that, can help him, 
you know, and so that's why maybe the foot just like grips up because <laughs> everything grips. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So with him, since he has that decreased Taylor cruel kind of access to motion, mainly because of over recruiting, I'm just wondering with him doing sway exercises but in addition to the other stuff that you're doing might be good because he would be on his foot. He would have to control his foot and he could start working on swaying forward at the ankles, swaying sideways, going in circles. And, you know, as he goes forward, that's going to trigger the posterior chain and maybe perhaps yeah. allow him to like stop over gripping in his upper abdominal region, diaphragm yeah. region, and then he and then from there you can give him the cue you know to slide yeah. you know i usually like slight belly button towards the backbone or you know yeah for guys you can say nuts to guts you know as for a, to, right. to yeah, trigger yeah, yeah. a little <laughs> bit of a pelvic floor lift um yeah. that seems to be the word that works really well with them so but you know the, the biggest thing is breath holding i that's where yeah. i would go with yeah. him is like have yeah. as he exercises as he moves have him start talking and you know just see if you you know he can hear the buckle points when it happens and yes. that's kind of will tell him that oops that's where your diaphragm is overworking so we need to yes. smooth that like out a self, like a self check yeah absolutely with the exercises and i wonder if he would just like maybe hum as he goes to lift that knee up if that would do it because you know if you're talking and humming you're going to have to recruit your core muscles a bit you're going to have, you don't want to do it hard so you don't want them yelling you know yeah. you just want him you know kind of doing it and it may be that that may inadvertently trigger him to stop holding with his diaphragm and start using those other muscles more. So when he uses them, he can do better. The question yes. is, why is he not using them? Right. And it's because other, I think probably the diaphragm in there is like the, the culprit. And that's, yeah, yeah. that's the Reiko lumbar junction, right? Cause that's where yes, the diaphragm exactly. sits. Yes. Yes. So. And that's, and he was using like I'm using my hands here, but he was like you doing this on his on his yeah. like on his lower abdominal cavity yesterday or no this week when I saw him, you know this this like this, and and that's why the dead but dead dead bugs did it to him. I mean that's a hard yeah. exercise for somebody like this, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty advanced exercise. It may seem innocuous, but it's but it's but it's it can you know just have to kind of meet people where they are just a little bit better and. You know, but that's, I would, you know, so I think doing the exercise that you did, I, I love the reformer because it violates some expectations, you know, and he has to flex, you know, he's, he's straightening his legs out and then he's pulling them in. So he's actually doing hip flexion, but using different muscles. And I think when you have him on the reformer, he has to trigger his core. Yeah in yes. that position because he can't do it yes. otherwise which is why he couldn't right. do it in the beginning so and i yeah. just think that yeah with the skiing he just kind of got back into the old movement system habit and probably was like the uh diaphragm was just really running the show yeah and and i know a lot of patients you know we all get them they're like oh i have to concentrate so hard on you know you know my cueing or mm -hmm. trying to let go and i'm like well yes you do to start with until it becomes ingrained in your brain Mm -hmm. that sort of mindful movement it's be like the, it's like a habit when you and i explained to him that when you're skiing this is a high load your body is going to default as you said to an old mm -hmm. movement pattern mm -hmm. it's normal this is normal and he did get a couple good days so he you know out of that but he hadn't skied and i think what what got me was that this guy i will tell you he is not your run of the mill and mm -hmm. um as we talked in the other episodes, he had these five regions of the body. And, I'm, and I always, and I, I went back to the, you know, to the initial assessment I did. And he always said to me, and sometimes I think we as therapists, we get not easily swayed, but we're like, oh yeah, you, the work on the foot made everything better. And then we're like, okay, great. And we're going to go down that rabbit hole, right? Oh, it's the foot's the driver. And it was, and it got him, got him much better. But then when he started to load his system, there was something in the back of my brain saying, you know, there's more than one issue here. This guy is too complex not to have in my practice or in my clinical practice. People like this, they have more than one driver, okay? And it may not appear in, unless until they load or, in, or until they do a, a movement that takes mm -hmm. away their compensation. And that's what skiing did for him. He couldn't invert his foot. So if, if let's say he had like ease, um, boots that were looser, mm -hmm. 
Would he feel it in his diaphragm? Probably not, because he could compensate in his foot. He'd feel it in his foot, I'll tell you that. He'd feel it in his anterior mm-hmm. tibialis. That's what he would feel. So mm-hmm. either way, he would feel something. Yeah. Because he, so, you know, and I think this was probably a good thing. So in terms of like the, so we, I can use like, I like the swaying. So I could do standing. So I did side to side stuff with him, but it was more controlled. It was more yeah. foot related, not like swaying and postural, mm-hmm. postural swaying. Yeah. So you're saying AP sideways. Yeah. Circling. Like, like, yeah. Just even in a circle, just that'll work the foot, but that'll help him access that the foot has to do different things mm-hmm. with different postural changes. And that'll, you know, that connection there will, you know, and just have him make sure that he is talking or humming so that he is not over recruiting that diaphragm. Got it. And the same thing, if you move into like some of those, so then when you have him do that, that's probably a great precursor to moving into like the chopping motions and the lawnmower pull motions, you know, those types of motions to start to kind of retrain the the multifidi a little bit, but it also retrains Mm -hmm. everything, lateral hips, foot, you know, it's a full body movement, but it brings rotation in. And so once you can get the diaphragm from over recruiting a little bit, then you can continue into those, you know, rotational movements that sway has to be part of. Yeah, but I think yeah. the sway will help, yeah. you know, kind of at least a place to start with and something he can do in standing. Yeah. So this is something he can do. It's pretty innocuous. He doesn't have to, you know what I'm saying? He can do it all day long. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, mm-hmm. it might be kind of a nice little uh, reset for him, especially if it kind of calms things down. Yeah, you know, yeah. To see, and that's something that he can return to like you've been sitting for a while stand up and do some sways you know standing is his big issue so if it's bothering you relax your foot and you know do the sways because if his foot is over gripping he won't be able to sway so his brain will figure it out you know we right, just need right. to give his movement system different things to do so that he can't rely on that old system he has to begin to build variants around it like you've been doing with him yeah 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 yeah, because with that skiing, you're right. He's so far forward with the skiing. And you just, I mean, you, I said to him, I said, how do you move your arms while you're skiing? He's like, well, you know, you, you're not like flinging your arms around, you know, you're pretty controlled, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, and I like the chopping. So I think he even started kneeling, but I don't think so. Because he just wants to, because I, I said, look, you don't need to keep releasing your foot. You can, but that's going to be a waste of your time at this point. Yeah. And I said that to him. And I said, you know, th- th- it is your main driver. However, you need to challenge your driver in different yeah. variable movement and, patterns. Yeah, and we've talked about that before. We've got to load the driver. And so the swaying is going to load the driver in different ways. The other thing oh. is with him on the reformer, he tucks his toes up underneath, right? When he's on hands on the bar and on his knees. Yes. You, you have him tuck his toes. I'm sure you do. Yes. But I just yes. want everybody out there to kind of pay attention to that because that's how we can help them get some foot control. Yeah. So they're not just on their knees with their feet flopped out. They're, no, to- they're, they're tucked under and their feet are like in a good position. On the shoulders. Yeah, and, and same thing yes. when you do some, you know, if he was going to work on some sit back stretches or maybe he was going to progress to pushing the ball, you know, like hands and knees, hands on the ball, you know, kind of like you would, you know, how the people will do those rollers on the floor. You do really need to be sure your feet are tucked up underneath for somebody yes. with this foot kind of deal going on. Mm-hmm. Um you know, so that could be helpful as well. I just wanted to point that out for everybody to kind of think about there that just because you're on your hands and knees doesn't mean that you can't bring the foot in. So if he was going to do tall kneeling, Mm -hmm. you know, as an exercise, you know, to just change positions and, uh, you know, work on, you know, having to control the the pelvis and the, you know, trunk a little bit Mm -hmm. better and take the foot out of it, we still wouldn't necessarily take the foot out of it. We would have those have them tucked up under and those toes underneath them, you know, so that there's that piece there. So it's not just the feet flopped and not really like, you know, being out of the picture. We really want that whole body connection with him, you know, to see. Now you may do it at first without the feet tucked under if you're trying to just see how does he look without the feet in the picture, you know, but Mm -hmm. yes you had already determined that his that yeah. foot was so important. Yes. So, you know, then you tuck that foot under and see if everything improves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think yeah. in hindsight, you know, of course the skiing is going to make them worse. It took away his compensation. So, yeah. you know, the issue with the diaphragm real quickly before I finish is that, mm-hmm. so the talking, the breathing, the humming, he's going to do that with all exercises pretty much. Just yeah. Control mm-hmm. the breathing. Okay. 
Okay. Um, most people don't realize how much they're holding their breath. Yes. You know, and and it may and it's just super subtle, and it he doesn't ha it won't be forever, but it yeah. it's just a nice reminder because you cannot talk and hold your breath at the same time. No. Completely impossible. Yeah. So and you know <laughs> with the next stuff that may actually begin to start to change his patterning around his neck and upper traps as well, because yeah. he's accessing and using, you have to access and coordinate the muscles around, you know, the larynx yes. and in vocal folds to hum and to talk and to do those things. And so, you know, if he likes it, it's time to put on his favorite music and, and just kind of lightly sing as he does his exercises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's always a good one too. Like, you know, when you're going to do this, if you're going to go run, turn on some music and be sure that you're singing a little bit as you go yeah. or humming as you go so that, you know, you can check in and make sure, yeah, I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think um, looking at his body chart, you know, yes, he, he, he actually put his hands around his neck, like, like a chokehold and around mm. his upper traps. And if you're gripping and trying to breathe his accessory respiratory muscle, yeah. that makes complete sense, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, so I that, will, no, go ahead, yeah, no, that's that's good. And you know, the yeah. other thing you can do is you can have him while he's on the reformer, you know, with his arms on there, and or he can just sit and grab a hold of the arms of his chair mm -hmm. so he can't move his yeah. arms and have him take some good deep breaths through his chest. Mm -hmm. And that'll mm -hmm. just get the pec muscles pulling on the on the chest wall, which mm -hmm. he needs for skiing and running. Yeah, and things yeah, like yeah. that. So he can do that. Um, he can, hang, you know, you can put a theraband around him and he can grab hold of it with his hands. And then he can like move one as he breathes in and moves the other as he breathes in. So you can get that because we really yeah. want him to access that whole chest wall movement. Yes. Um, you know, while he so he can hyper respirate better. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And, you know, and that'll help probably the neural sensitivity a bit. Yes. Yeah. I awesome. Agree. Uh, very well. Awesome. So I will, um, I, I will update. <laughs> um, I think this is interesting. If, yeah, so, let's do, um, let's hear what happens. You know, we've got up, up episode 109, 110. That was the initial with him. And then this is episode so, uh, 118. Well, 118. So and if you didn't catch 109, 110, go listen to I would it. Listen to that first. Yeah. 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 And then come back in and hear this one so that you can pull the story through. Awesome. Well, thank you, Susan, as always. Thank you to listeners and uh, enjoy. Yes, and don't forget uh, tough to treat .supercast com. Join oh. us in the membership. Yep. Bye. Bye.